previously on Everything Wrong with Justice League. One of these things is not like the others. One of these things doesn't belong. Can you tell which thing is not like the other by the time I finish this song? Well, that Aquaman scene was quite a lot to take in, wasn't it? But we ain't done with Bruce Wayne yet as we cut to him on a plane. By the way, this scene's entirely Joss Whedon, so keep that in mind. And Bruce is currently shaving his beard off. Now, if only Warner Bros. was able to do that with Henry Cavill's mustache. But like I said, there's a big discrepancy in time with Bruce having a beard during that previous scene because we saw him without one in the opening sequence, and I have to assume he went to Aquaman's hometown the moment those mother boxes were created by that parademon. But whatever, the beard's gone now, and... Oh man, whoever did the color grain for this scene should be ashamed of themselves. Ben Affleck looks awful here. So you say you have no way of reconnecting with this Aquaman? Oh, I put a tracking device in his coat. He left without it. May in fact not have been his coat. Well, you're sure as hell right about that, Bruce. That absolutely was not his coat we saw in that reshoot. So after not being lucky with Aquaman, Alfred tells Bruce about another recruit that he managed to get. Barry Allen, also known as The Flash. And here, they go into the backstory of Barry's father, who was put in prison for the suspected murder of his wife. They told this backstory during Barry and his father's talk in the Snyder Cut, but it happens here instead because, well, if they let that scene in, the movie would go on just above two hours, and we can't have that. We have holiday royalties to earn. What about, uh, Diana? Well, if you have her number, you could have called her. Oh. Perhaps I should fly to Paris with a handwritten note. Will you be Bruce's teammate? Check yes or no. I think that's one of the only Whedon jokes I actually kind of like in this film. I'm only interested in her skill set. I'm sure you are. And joke ruined. Thank you, Joss. Next, they go into Cyborg, and can I just say, how disrespectful do you have to be towards Snyder's scenes of Cyborg that you would turn them into unrealistic security footage that are obviously shot as a film? This will not be the only time they do this, unfortunately. And here is where we get another error in this movie. Alfred mentions that Victor Stone is dead, and Bruce is taken aback by it. Uh... Did you forget that you saw that man come back to life when his father used that mother box back in Batman v Superman? Oh, sorry, I forgot. We're calling a black hole of a universe, so clearly nothing from the previous events actually matters. One misses the days when one's biggest concerns were exploding wind-up penguins. Ha! I get it. I should probably point this out as well, while all the other characters have gone through some changes in this movie, Batman's character in this version is more or less the same as he is in the Snyder version. Well, when I say they're the same, I mean in terms of his motivation of building a team in the honor of the late Superman. As for his character, ho <laughs> ho, not so much. Now we get into The Flash, and while his talk with his father was entirely shot by Snyder, this little opening was done by Whedon. While it does show us the guard notifying Alfred and Bruce about Barry's presence like Alfred said there would be, it's also for Joss Whedon to put in another joke. What, you got a problem? No, there's no problem. <laughs> Better not be. Well, at least it's a bit of a humorous visual joke, but it kind of interrupts the tone with the next scene. The heart-to-heart -heart talk between Barry and his father is taken pretty seriously here, but adding this joke in before it does nothing but cause tonal whiplash to the scene. Time and place for comedy seems to be a foreign concept for Joss Whedon, don't you think? While I don't have much to say about this scene as it is simply a condensed Snyder scene with not many errors to point out, besides probably the glass showing Barry's head moving randomly, actually scratch that because just as I was editing this video, I noticed Barry's father has his hand on his face in this shot, but in the previous one, it was not on his face at all. Quite an oversight, guys. This moment is clearly supposed to set up an arc for the Flash when his father tells him to make his own future. But that doesn't go anywhere in this cut. Flash is basically a nothing character. Besides being comic relief for the rest of the group, and oh my god, I am dreading the moments where I have to talk about that. 
Now we are into Cybart's character, but first we are introduced to his father leaving for the night, but not before talking to the janitor for a bit. This shot I have to assume is Whedon's because, well, it looks fake, but I don't get why this was added in. It doesn't really add to anything other than once again telling us that everyone believes Victor is dead, which we already knew. But now we properly get into Cyborg's character. And I'm sure you have heard this many times before, but out of all the characters that were affected by these reshoots, Cyborg has gotten it the worst. Almost 95% of Cyborg's scenes have been reshot, and his entire backstory that was shown very prominently in the original 2017 trailers are nowhere to be seen here. No scenes with him and his mother, no scene where he adapts to his abilities, no scenes where he shows clear resentment to his father, no amount of actual development for his character, we get nothing. This character is a literal walking robot. I feel very bad for Ray Fisher here. Of all the actors who were very unhappy about how this film turned out, Ray was the most vocal about the terrible environment he was in when the reshoots happened. He went into great detail about just how bad the studios handled the film and the situation with its treatment towards the cast. And how did the studio respond to his concerns? By writing him out of Ezra Miller's The Flash and halting any progress on the cyborg film that they promised would get made. All of that because the actor dared to speak out about the working environments at Warner Brothers. What a fucking disservice to an actor that had so much potential. To say the Snyder Cut did the character justice would be an understatement of the century. He really did become the heart of that film. Joss Whedon had every opportunity to find ways to do that with his version, but chose not to. I get he had to cut a lot of fat down, but instead of making scenes that matter to the characters, he went with this garbage instead. Absolute travesty. <sighs> okay, well let's get back on track. So Cyborg is in his home, hiding away from everyone because of his changed body. Silas tries to get him to compromise, but to no avail. And rather than showing us Cyborg learning his abilities, they instead go down the route that many lazy writers in Hollywood like to take with a little thing called, Tell, Don't Show. In processing, I can access everything, but I can't put it all together. Not yet. But if you worked with me, if we had to change engines... So you do to someone else, which it did to me. And that's all we get. Yeah, wonderful. I'm glad you spent all that time making over 80 pages of rewrites to let us know Cyborg's character very well, Whedon. For them to see the monster. You are not a monster. It's weird that you thought it meant me. Wait, what? Then what monster were you referring to? Doomsday? I'm pretty sure he's long dead. What I did, I lost your mother in that accident. I couldn't bear to lose my son. But you did. That is about the most you'll ever get regarding Cyborg's backstory. Just them explain away. Oh, but they do at least show him learning one ability in this part. <laughs> couldn't do that last night. Remember. 80 pages. It seems like they're trying to set up an arc for Victor feeling like a monster with his completely changed body that he has, but much like Flash's arc with his dad, this doesn't go anywhere. So this entire scene, besides introducing to Cyborg, has no purpose. So we cut back to the janitor cleaned up at Star Labs and hold the fuck up, look at his ID picture. Is that the same one we saw in this reshoot? If you guess no, then congratulations, you have eyes. Anyways, he hears ruckus going on in one of the labs, and when he opens up the curtains to see what's going on, I don't know, because they cut away before we see anything. Way to cheapen the tension, guys. So after all that back and forth between me and Flash, Cyborg, and cutting back to the janitor, now we're focusing on the daughters of Themyscira. All of this is Snyder, except for one thing, and you might already know what that is. Any changes today? No, my queen. Your mother Brooks has awoken, yet nothing has happened. 
Ha <laughs> uh, daughters, I, I'm sorry to ask, but uh, what the hell's going on here? There is no explanation what this box is, why it's making noises, why it woke up at all, and why we're supposed to be concerned about it. It has slept for thousands of years since the first age. Why did it wake at all? I don't know, because the movie never explains it. But the box breaks open, a portal vent opens up, and we get our first look at the villain Steppenwolf. And oh my god, he looks terrible. Design-wise, he looks fine, I guess. It is slightly closer to how he looks in the comics. But in terms of how the CGI looks, it is horrible. Once again, this happened due to the strict deadlines and therefore they didn't have time to complete his model. I can at least excuse that if his character was written well enough to distract me from the technical shortcomings this film might have. But then he starts talking. Mother. Searching. At last, you call me home. Did we just hear this big dumb aluminum foil wearing clown say mutter? Yeah, it is a mutter box, but you usually add in the last parts when saying mutter too. Wow, that was our first impression of this villain. Off to a good start. And just to get this out of the way, all of Steppenwolf's lines, minus a few, were written by Joss Whedon. While there might be some scenes that are largely the same in the Snyder Cuts, with the only difference being Steppenwolf's design, he is very much an entirely different character in this version. What kind of character is he? I don't know, because we know nothing about him in this entire movie. We don't know anything about his past, we don't know what his motivations are, we don't know why he likes to call for his mommy all the time, and he never stops monologuing. Millennia in exile. Noble queen, why do you fight? You were born of her. A creature of chaos. I know, but you will feed, and my exile will come to an end. I will take my place among the new gods. It's not even like his speeches have anything noteworthy to tell us. It's all nothing but generic villain talk that you have heard many times from other bad supervillains. Joss has done absolutely nothing for the character of Steppenwolf except turning him into another power-hungry CGI villain that only Marvel Studios could pull off reusing in their movies. And before you ask, Yes, his character was handled much better in the Snyder Cut. Not only did he get a huge upgrade in his design and actually look intimidating, but you also understood his motivations to where you can see him as an actual person and not a bunch of polygons used to create the 3D model. He's not the best superhero villain we have gotten by any means, but he most certainly left an impression on us there more than he does in this. Anyways, he uses his axe, which I guess summons the parademons to his location, and they start pouring out of his portal. This might have been a nice first view of his minions, if we didn't already see that at the beginning of the movie with Batman, and also from that janitor. As a matter of fact, how are there even parademons there? How did they manage to get to Earth before Steppenwolf ever even summoned the portal to Themyscira? After another sporadically edited fight between them and the big dumb CGI clay model, the queen runs to the entrance before the door closes, and despite being barely in the middle of the door, she's somehow fully out on the other side in this next shot. Uh, what? He just busted through the wall? So much for sealing the cage! Also, I know I slammed the CGI on Steppenwolf already, but man, does he look way worse when he's in sunlight. They try running away with the murder box, but Steppenwolf knocks them down and steals it. And then we are treated to a speech that really creeps me out. After the unity, you will join my legion and you will know the righteousness of power. You will love me. You all will. Uh, uh, no comment. Now that the mother box is gone, they send out a warning fire near Diana's location. While this is a heavily edited scene, there are not many errors to point out. Good. I really needed a break from all the continuity whiplash I have seen from this damn movie. Here, when we see Diana at her job, we get a very awkward cut of her turning around to see the TV that's broadcasting the fire the Amazonians sent out. 
I'm not sure if this is a Whedon reshoot, but from what I can see, the statue seemed to have either moved a bit or her arm moved from the statue's right part of its forehead to its left. But that's not even the awkward part. It's Diana's reaction to the TV report. She hears about the Amazon shrine and almost immediately knows what's happening. In Snyder's version, the scene lingers on for a bit longer with the TV going on in the background. And you can see in her face that she starts to puzzle what's going on. And only then does she turn around to see what is happening. It flows a bit better there, whereas in this, it happens so abruptly. Again... I know they want to cut down on the time to reach 2 hours, but it's because of this that many scenes go by so fast and they don't get a chance to breathe as much as they do in Snyder's version. Oh god, I just found out what the next scene is. <sighs> we get a shot of a news channel at the Daily Planet reporting on a woman who lost her husband from a bunch of... You know what? Watch it yourself. My Howard is a good man. He's a provider. And these aliens are gonna f probe him? Come down to the lake view, and I'll stick a f probe up your aliens, you. What the hell is that? Well, that was awful. Glad to see this movie take itself seriously with a news report like that. Anyways, we get into Lois Lane working out the. Oh my god! Fucking hell, the colors, man! I I'm sorry, I know I keep going on and on about the color grading in this movie, but I can't stress enough how bad this movie looks. This is the ugliest superhero movie I have ever seen in my life. Every color pops out like a zit on a forehead. It's not subtle, it's not appealing, it's just nauseating to look at. I know superhero films now get a bad rep for washing out their colors a lot, but at the very least, they have a style that makes the movies stand out in their visuals, and they don't make it look like all of their actors have spent too many hours out in the sun. Joss is known for being a TV show director throughout most of his career, and it absolutely shows in Justice League. This man has no goddamn clue how to make a movie look like a movie. He failed with that in Avengers, and he failed with it here. How can you jokers call Snyder's version of the Justice League unwatchable when I can't even go 5 seconds looking at your cinematic train wreck without feeling like I'm about to vomit all over my TV screen? Oh my god. How about we move on? This scene is supposed to replicate the Marfa and Lois talk that was in Snyder's version. Only they decide to add in some jokes that I... Honestly, do not understand. Hey, Lane, who is your source? Um, the activist. Well, I'll see if she'll take your call. Oh, so it's a she. It's not a she. Okay, am I just dumb, or does this joke really not make any sense? I mean, it is just weed and humor, so I don't expect them to land ever, but I should at least know what the hell they're supposed to be about. It was uh, hard coming back here at all. Well, I can hardly read the news anyway. So much bitterness. Of course, I think it's all because he's gone. But I suppose a mother does. Oh, look. An actual sweet scene. And Clark promised me you were going to bring home another Pulitzer. Oh, did he? Oh, yes, he did. He said that you were the thirstiest young woman he ever met. Or maybe not. Thanks again, Whedon. <laughs> Hungriest. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> I think if you were to look very closely at the two, you can see the utter pain in their eyes as they realize this movie is not going anywhere good. And unfortunately, we are out of time once again. As usual, we will discuss more about this cinematic blunder next time. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in part 3.